Okay, so point three, um, and this is a biggie. This is something I've often described as, as being the number one myth in marketing. And it's the probably the biggest trap that most people fall into. And that is that because, especially if we're the business owner, if we're the person who's created the business, or in many cases, we are the business. Yeah, we as the individual are the yeah, we're the face of the business, especially if it's a small business or a solo business owner. We become incredibly preoccupied with the fact that, um, excuse me, that it's all about us, um, or it's about the product, or the service that we offer. And what we're doing constantly is we're, we're looking at this product or this service, and we're, we're inviting people to come over and we're saying, this is what I've got, you, you need to be buying this, or, or worse than that, let me sell this to you. And um, the focus is on the product or the service. And actually, that's completely the wrong way to look at it. The thing you should be focusing on most in your marketing is your customer. Yeah. Most people have tunnel vision, complete tunnel vision, and they look only at their product or service and assume that if they, if they create a good enough product, or brand, whatever it is, or a package, they can then express that to the world and somebody, or enough people hopefully, from this mass audience, enough of people will put their hand in the air and say, yes please, can I have one? And that is a very, very random, very fragmented way of, um, of, of designing your marketing plan. Your focus has to be really on the customer and what the customer wants, what's important to them. Now you may say, well, how do they know what they want? And how do they know but they want what I have, they don't know it exists. And that's extremely, you know, that's extremely relevant and, and, and valid. For a customer to feel comfortable about buying from you, they need to have an emotional reason to buy from you. And I would suggest that the holistic industry probably represents this even more so than lots of other industries. You know, at the end of the day, uh, a little red light flashes on my car and tells me that it wants feeding, and yet again, I'm gonna have to stop off at the petrol station that's a grudge purchase. I don't really have a lot of choice. I have a choice. I can decide not to drive. I can get a bike. I can walk. I can buy a horse. Um, but there are certain things that we have that we feel pretty much compelled to buy, and those are described as grudge purchases. When we move away from that, we move towards things that are much more emotive um, and personal to us, and are possibly even less essential, uh, but they're things that we really want and we really desire. Gadgets. It becomes, yeah, it becomes very, very important that we connect with people at an emotional level as to why that's important to them. I was listening to a really interesting um, radio uh, report yesterday, a radio segment on BBC. Um, perhaps you can share the link. I'll dig the link out and share it with this one. Um, and it was about consumerism in the future. And it was talking about the fact, the prediction that in the future, we as consumers will have a lot less. Okay. We, we will physically own a lot less. We will have a lot less stuff, which, let's be honest, is probably a really good idea. I think that's a good but idea. But what it said yeah. is that, the, yeah, and it said that but the stuff that we'll have will be really important to us, and most importantly, will be much higher value. Okay. So instead of accumulating and consuming on a daily basis and just buying random stuff that, you know, has a very short lifespan in terms of our interest and, and, and very much part of the disposable culture that we've got used to. As we roll forward into the future, and presumably certainly as our children grow up and become more active consumers, we won't be consuming lots and lots of random things that we're mildly attached to. What we'll actually start to do is we'll start to focus in on things and we'll own less, but those things will have a much higher value to us. And I think that's absolutely on the button. I think that's an incredibly astute observation, and I subscribe to it 100% because people's desire to spend money and waste money is, is waning. What they're becoming more interested in, more focused on, is what really makes a difference to them. Yeah, absolutely. Holistic and isn't it? Is, holistic is really important, I think, in that sense. And I think certainly the thing with holistic business, going on to that whole point about the whole customer thing and 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 the value and and you've got the grudge purchases you've got the kind of gadgety purchases which are kind of ooh, i'd really like that but you don't necessarily really need it you know a brand new stereo you've already got a stereo that works perfectly well but the thing with holistic treatments is um 
obviously you've got a whole nother spectrum within that one as well. So you've got the, the grudge ones where you've, you've had an injury and you have to go and see someone to get fixed because you're in pain. And then you've got yeah. the, the real kind of spa days. You've got no real need to go, but you just really want to go and just have a total kind of lovely spa day. And then you've got the general massage. And I think the thing is that people don't put enough emphasis on the importance of those. And I think we live in such a stressful society that to have a massage regularly actually is a health choice rather than not. And I suppose one of the biggest challenges with our, with a lot of the, I mean, not all of our people on the directory and, and listening to this will be therapists as such. We've got coaches, counselors, product sellers and all of that sort of stuff. But a lot of it is, the perception is still there and we're trying to obviously break that down. It's still perceived as being a, a kind of luxury purchase and it's a treat yeah. for yourself. And I think a lot of them would have a challenge to try and get that point across that in actual fact, it is a luxury and it is looking after you, but actually that's really important. Yeah. And I don't even know whether luxury is the right word. I, um, you know, I think as people become much more aware and I see it all the time, I see a rising awareness of uh, people's, uh, uh, understanding of health benefits and, and again you know we, you could probably even look at the fact that because we are simply we're far more interconnected now as a community and social media has got a big part to play in this um, you know I'm much more aware of people people to be fair who are probably more on the periphery of my social network and I don't mean my online social network I just mean literally my people I'm connected to um, I'm much more aware of people who are possibly suffering with health issues in some cases very serious health issues um, and those health issues are brought around about through stress and anxiety and work um, and, and a lot of obviously a lot of those issues are, are a manifestation of people's mental state, their, mental, their state of mental well-being and people are, are a lot more aware of their need to take care of themselves yeah. um, and taking care of yourself can never be a luxury so even though you, you may feel, well, this is a bit of a luxury, it's an indulgence, you know, I feel guilty, it's, you know, it's a naughty luxury that I, I shouldn't be enjoying. I think there are um, a, a lot more people are recognizing that actually it's quite important, and I, and I can be open about this and say I've been in, through periods of my life where I've suffered with um, uh, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, I've worked very, very hard, and you do kind of fall into a trap of... Um, I think, you know, that's fine. I'm okay. I can cope. I can cope. And then people start to say to you, you're not looking really, you know, you're not looking very well. And, and then you start to listen to it a bit more. And then when enough people say it to you, you suddenly think, ah, oh, the penny drops. And then you realize that it's not about um, doing it because it's a, a nice idea. It's about doing it because it's important. It's important to you personally. And obviously the, the effect of, of the people that rely upon us um, and people around us within our, within our family environment and so on. But I think the, the, the big thing with, with um, this concept of people focusing on things that are of higher value to them, and as I said, it's, it's important to remember we're not talking about higher monetary value, we're talking about higher emotional value and emotional attachment. The things that really excite us, and, and everybody listening and watching this today could probably stop and think, okay, what's the, what are the two or three things or the one thing in my life that's very important? And that could be music, and it could be art, and it could be movies, it could be cookery, and it could be exercise, and it could be relationships, um, um, it could be stamp collecting, it could be anything. Actually, the things that we often are most engaged in are the things that we could describe as being less important in terms of being essentials in life. Yeah. You know, I don't know many people who are incredibly, incredibly focused and, uh, uh, you know, on the essentials of life that are, you know, just the general day-to-day -day mundane chores and activities that we do to keep the wheels turning. What we, where we get our excitement, our enjoyment from, are things that are described as pastimes. And as I said, okay, it could be exercise, it could be food, it could be health, it could be various things which are important. Again, we argue are essential, but we don't perceive them in that way. We we do them and we enjoy them because we want them. And a, a good example would be things like music. Um, you know, music is an incredibly uh, emotive and passionate subject. I personally am I'm an individual that can't go through a day without listening to music of some description. I'm sure lots of people are like that. If I never heard another piece of music again, I wouldn't die, but it would certainly impact massively on the way I feel about myself and the way I feel about my life. So what I'm trying to get to here and the, and the point I'm making is find out what's really important to your customer. 
and, and, and looking at the holistic industry and looking at what I know and understand of it, what you've helped me understand of it, uh, in terms of what's on offer, what's available, it's a very, very broad range of services and products. Um, the main focus really is, is what's, what really is important to the customer in that. Uh, and in most cases, it is the experience. And again, just reverting back to my comment about the, um, the, the BBC uh, broadcast yesterday, was the description that owning less, consuming less, owning less, having less, but having less things that are of higher value to us. Um, the description, the ultimate description that was used was, and most of those will be experiential, yeah. rather than tangible. And I think that is a very, very interesting concept for us all to think about and adopt. Good way forward. Absolutely. So, shall we summarise? Why not? Well, we've got we've got a little bit of time, and I know that you've still got a couple of little points on here that potentially would be a really good thing for our listeners to just tap into. Um, with the last two yeah, I mean the, the, your, it's all the last couple of points country. really on this. Yeah, um, as I said, most people make the mistake of focusing on the um, on the business or the product or the service. They don't focus on the customer. Yeah. The best businesses in the world, the businesses we love, and I mean the businesses we love, we enjoy, we feel happy, we have a personal connection to, those businesses leave us with a sense that they understand who we are. Yeah, absolutely. And the relationship is a very personal relationship. Whether it's the guy that makes your coffee in the morning, or whether it's your hairdresser or the guy down the garage or the lady you speak to on the phone to uh, order uh, your supplies, whatever it is, the best businesses that we feel connected to are the businesses that we feel we have a relationship with. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. So I would, I would say that before you even start marketing, the first thing you should do is you should find out, and not guess, but you should find out what's really important to your customer. Um, and there is one really simple way of doing that, and that is ask them, ask them what's important to them. Simple, and you can do that in a number not, of different ways. Yeah, simple but not often utilised. Very few people do it. Very, very few people in business. When when I say, suggest to them, you know, have you spoken to your customers? Have you asked them what? what have you asked them what they like about your business? And have, have you asked them what, what, what they think you can improve on? Um, a lot of business owners look amused and even horrified that they thought they are going to have to kind of take the mask off and approach their customers and ask for help. And how you got and things say, like Survey you know, Monkey and. And places like that, you know, surveys. Here. I know these other things, it's just a quick thing. You can set it up, it's free, and just whiz it out. And you just get, we just did it with a client yesterday um, about some products. And it was just mainly, it was asking what keywords that, that people are using to search for their products. Yeah. And it was, it's just really interesting because, and I did it as myself the other day about a branding. <coughs> it's just, it's words you don't necessarily think are, are going to be used. And, and it's, and that you know the best feedback is the feedback that you're not expecting because then you can really utilize yeah. that <clears throat> absolutely and those tools exist they're really simple to use um, you can automate them i mean the great thing to survey monkeys you'll know is that it, it produces your results puts all your results into a very neat report so you can see what you've got the information you've got that makes life really easy for you um, and those tools that exist at the moment are, are really powerful. You know, you don't have to wade through spreadsheets and try to assess all of the information that, that they, those tools are going to be used for you. So you can go down one of two routes. You can use things like surveys and polls, um, or you can be much more direct and much more personal. And you can email, and you can write, or have a bit. You can even pick up the phone and you can ring your customers and say, to "Wow, them, and you <laughs> answer a couple of questions." Yeah, and, and that's, you know, it's surprising how people forget to do that. And, and frequently I'll say to a client, you know, please you know, get your client list now, randomly pick half a dozen of them, and make a plan over the next week to pick up the phone um, and ring each one and ask them maybe two questions. And, and the two questions you could ask are, what do you like about us? You know, why, why do you choose us as a business to do, you know, to do business with? Um, and the most important customer service question you can ever ask is, what can we do better? Um, and that's a very simple thing that you can do. You can learn so much about your business. And as you've just said, that information can be hugely valuable as well in terms of helping the business owner understand where they should be going in and marketing, what direction should they be going in. Because look at it this way. What if you choose one of your products or services to market and it takes you three months and a lot of money to suddenly realize, actually, that's the product that your customers are least interested in. Just because you like it and you think it's great and you think you should be selling it and it may be that you've got good commercial reasons for wanting to sell it, could be that actually it's the product the customers least like. 
and when you ask the question, often when you ask customers a question, you will often get a result back that is not what you expect. So ask them, get inside their head, um, and then the last point, the third point really, is test your message. Uh, once you know what they want and you know why they want it, you know what's important to them, then test it. Create a test message. Um, and maybe in another uh, webinar podcast we can talk about things like split testing. But test your message and find out whether that message engages people. Don't just keep hammering that message out over and over and over again. Um, I've seen some incredible examples of businesses that will send out you know, 500 letters in a week. Uh, it's the same standard letter, and you know, with the details changed, top to mail version, maybe even some of the red sign on the bottom, and they don't get a very good result. So their answer to that is, well, we're sending out 500 letters a week, we're not really making a lot of progress. Let's send out 1,000 letters a week, or let's send out 2,000 letters a week. Yeah. Doing more of something that doesn't work, doesn't work. It just makes you busier, and you spend more money, and, you, and your scale of failure is, is, is higher. Yeah. So test your message, test it in different ways, and use that information and that feedback to get the result. And, and I suppose the, the best summary I can give for this point is that actually marketing is often is not about talking, it's more about listening. Very, very few people in business understand the crucial aspect of marketing is about listening, not about talking. And, and it's not small businesses that do this, it's big businesses as well, big brands in particular are very, very good at their PR and projecting their message out to the audience. Um, but they don't want to hear what's coming from the back. And look at what we're experiencing today. We're experiencing an environment now where people can go on Twitter and they can directly talk to the uh, managing director, the chief executive of a large petrol company or a large um, gas company or an airline, for example, and they can make their point heard. And millions of people around the world can hear that point as well at the same time. If you're not listening to what your customers are telling you, um, that, that sense of arrogance is going to catch up with you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So in summary then, what would you say is our kind of, or in summary, but also maybe an action steps of, of what would you say would be that, that if they were going to go, if, if whoever's listening to this now is going to go away and do one thing, what's their first thing that they should go and do after, after listening to this? Okay, there are probably two categories. There are people who are in business and have been in business, I would suggest, for maybe a year or more. Yeah. And then there are people who are only just starting out in business. Maybe they haven't even started in business. Maybe they're just about to think about it, or they're literally in the first flush, those first two or three weeks or two or three months of being in business. Um, looking at the first group, the first category, um, I would say the best thing uh, anybody can do in that kind of situation, first of all, is just to stop. To stop and take stock and to step back and have a really serious look at what they know about their business. And when I say what they know, not what they have a sense of, but what they can identify and what they can evidence. Mm -hmm. What kind of customer do we currently sell to? Does that kind of customer match up the profile of what we expect those customers to be? What do they actually buy? What do they buy from us? Are they buying from us what we want them to buy from us? Are they buying from us what we expect them to buy from us? So look at the type of customer, look at the type of product, and then to start to understand how their business looks from the outside in. Uh, it's, it's a natural, instinctive reaction or occurrence for people in business. The, the busier you get, the longer you work in your company, the bigger and the more structural you make your organization or your, your company, the more enclosed you become and frequently the more cut off you become from your customers. And there's a sliding scale of that effect. So the first thing I would say is to stop. Um, if you're spending any money on marketing at all, and that includes time, because time's money as well. Not necessarily stop what you're doing, but step back and have a really hard, serious look at it and ask yourself this question. Is it working? And how do I know it's working? And, and against what parameters am I setting that? Again, this myth, this, 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 this awful myth of getting your name out there, we're busy, we're spending money, we're spending a marketing budget, and we're making sales. You know, you could be spending 100,000 pounds a year and you could be making £500,000 a year worth of sales. It could well be that the £100,000 a year you're spending, £10,000 of that is generating all of your sales, mm -hmm. and the other £90,000 is just waste. So just because you're spending money on you're making money doesn't necessarily mean the two are, are directly connected or effectively connected. So if you're an existing business, I would say stop and, and take a really serious hard look at what you're doing. 
and it doesn't matter how big or how small the business is, even if you're a micro business, you're, you've still got information you can look at and understand and, and learn to interpret and get help with that if you need help with that. Excellent. If you're a new business and you're starting out, um, do your research. Uh, again, there, there is a, a common um, issue with people when they start in business is their first few weeks, their first few months, there is a huge degree of enthusiasm, a huge degree of excitement, and they go charging off down the road uh, with great aspirations that their business is going to be successful in the next six months, and within a year they're going to be lying on the beach somewhere spending their money. Um, frequently that doesn't happen. Yeah. So Absolutely. have a plan. Have a plan. And, and most importantly, recognize that marketing is going to be something that is going to be the spine of your business. It's going to be the skeleton, the spine, the, 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 the scaffolding that you're going to hang your business on. Uh, I remember looking um, looking through a business plan um, for somebody a few years ago, a very, very intelligent lady who came from the NHS who was providing a service, who was moving into the public, private sector and selling her services into healthcare. Um, very big lady, and she presented me with a business plan and asked me to review it for her. And it was fantastic, except there was one glaring omission. Uh, there was no marketing plan in the business plan. She'd worked out absolutely everything else. And when I raised this with her, this is sat there, I said, where's the marketing plan? And she snatched the business plan, I had literally snatched it out of my hands and flicked through it and said, I can't believe it. I haven't written anything about marketing. So she'd be incredibly focused on our product, she'd be incredibly focused on how our business would work, how she would deliver our products and services, all of the financials, all the commercials. But the one crucial thing she'd completely forgotten about was how was she actually going to sell what she had. Which I'm sure is. I'm, I'm guessing that's fairly common. Oh, far more than you would expect. Far, far more than you would expect. And I'm going to stick my neck out there now and say um, I would suggest that a minimum of 90% of businesses that fit within the SME sector and the micro sector have no, have absolutely no plan on what they're doing in terms of their marketing. And that's partly because they don't know how to do it, they don't know where to start, or a lot of it is, is apathy. Because they're making money, and they will often think, well, if I'm making money, then clearly we're okay, whatever we're doing works, so why do we need a marketing plan? Yeah. That's changed in the past few years. I have lots of people who come to me on a weekly basis and ask me for help and advice because my business has been successful for 10, 15, 20 years. Over the past two or three years, has gone into decline, and they don't know why. Yeah. Um, you know, Their business has grown and been successful almost by accident. Now, all of a sudden, it's not working. And you don't know how to arrest that, that, that problem. Fantastic. Well, that's brilliant. And I'm sure that, that people are going to go over loads of value from today. So thank you very much. So how can it's they get in pleasure. touch with you if they want to be learning more about marketing? Obviously, we'll put links on, on the YouTube clip and, and also on the page as well with some action steps and things. But so what are you doing? You've got your Make Marketing Work, which is an online... Yeah, course. I mean, the, the online course, the, the online course, uh, I wrote the online course earlier this year. Um, the Academy, which has been around for three years, um, is a physical training um, opportunity and environment. I've moved away from that now to focus more on delivering uh, my knowledge online because it just means I can, I can reach out to a wider audience and more people can learn about marketing. So makemarketingwork.co.uk is the website. Get on the site, read it, read the blogs, subscribe, take uh, one of the trial sections. I know obviously we've talked about releasing uh, a special offer for your community as well, uh, which I'm love to support and uh, make it easy for them to take their first few steps. Just hopefully, my biggest hope really is that from today's presentation, um, it inspires people to, to take on marketing as a subject and look forward to enjoying it and, and going through the journey. Uh, but jump on the website, make it marketing work code UK, pick up the phone, call me, Skype me, email. Um, there are a lot of marketing gurus. I don't describe myself as that, but a lot of marketing gurus out there that hide behind their website and their blog. You can never speak to them, you never hear from them. Um, if you've got a question, contact me. I am a real human being. <laughs> and a very lovely one at that. Thank you so, very much. <laughs> and I know they can get hold of a free, the, that you've got freebies on there as well. And the blog is obviously fascinating to follow. So in terms of getting marketing tips and stuff, they can go there, they can get a load of free stuff. And then they can obviously, if they want to learn more, then they can do the course or they can get in touch. Yeah, with there are free sections. Um, yeah, the, the course is broken down into modules. Sorry, you can probably hear the rain a little bit here. Um, the course is broken down into modules. They can take the first module for free. Then if they like that, they can pick up the second model and we can progress from there. Or, as I say, what we'll do is we'll put a, a nice offer together for them. So if they want to um, 
to engage in the course and get into the course, get ahead into the course, um, they can uh, they can pick that up and, and they can start with it. And, and it's a course that you take at your own pace. It's not set on a specific time scale. You could spend the next um, two or three months going to the course. You could spend the next two or three years going to the course. It's designed really to be incredibly flexible and adaptable. You can study it on your iPad or, or your laptop or on your iPhone, even on your smartphone. You can, you can take it with you. Um, it's about small progressive steps. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much. And we will it's obviously see you on the other side. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Sophie. Bye-bye.